Uh, good morning, everybody. Wonderful that uh, you are here. It will take time uh, to be with us. Uh, just um, before starting the, the lecture, maybe it's good to have some background of me as well as a scholar, uh, and then later I will give you some insight in, into my personal background. Um, I started in the Netherlands uh, studying anthropology. I call myself disciplinary nomad, so because I have been traveling around different disciplines. I started as anthropologist, studying anthropology. Uh, next to it, I started uh, to do the second study of philosophy. And then for my PhD um, thesis, I went to the city of Nijmegen. I was starting, actually starting in Amsterdam, and then I went to, the, to Nijmegen, which is the eastern part of Netherlands. And then I worked within the gender studies um, department. I did my PhD there. And then I came back to Amsterdam uh, in organization science uh, department as an assistant professor. And then now we are working in sociology department. So you can imagine all these disciplines coming together. And, and that's why I position myself, myself in different disciplines. And you will see also the insights I share with you comes from different disciplines. Um, so I, I am very curious how, how you, you will see them, hear them, and interact with them. But when we talk about polyfocal governance or polyfocal forms of policy making. What do we mean with that? Um, this starts actually, as you have probably have heard or seen that there is a global attention for including the perspectives of minority groups we make policy about in the process of policy making and decision making processes. There is a global attention for it. And then the first question is, why do we do that? And one of the advocates in one of our projects actually answered that question, which is very insightful, very close to, the, to our experiences. He said, can you imagine that you are living somewhere in a city as an inhabitant, and there are all these decisions made about your living condition without consulting you? Can you imagine that? And that is what is often happening to refugees, for example. There are a lot of decisions made about them, about their uh, asylum, about their integration process, about their inclusion in, in organizations, without having their perspectives included in that process. So that is not very positive for refugees, but most importantly, probably not very positive for decision-making process, because then you don't get the necessary connection to the life world of refugees to broaden the horizon of decision making. So it is inclusion of a variety of perspectives is important not only for refugees and their uh, future, but also for policymakers to, to make their horizon uh, broader than uh, only um, having one perspective included in that. But then the next question is, if we do that, how do we make uh, governance uh, or policy making or decision making in policy processes impactful? What is necessary to do that? It starts actually with, in, in the literature, we are talking often about participatory governance. It's a concept which has come up. And participatory governance is about including voices and perspectives of, of citizens in the decision making process. Most of us know, actually, the inclusion in advisory boards. Eh? Probably you have that as well in, in the way you're working. Advisory boards that brings people in, for example, refugees or asylum seekers, to discuss the issues about decision making uh, uh, and policy making. But then there has been also recently much more, um, much broader, I have to say, forms of citizen uh, perspective included in summits. Have you probably heard of citizen summits? Like uh, there has been uh, this um, uh, uh, David Ryberg, uh, who is actually a Belgian uh, uh, public figure, and he introduced this notion of G1000, so that you actually create citizen summits um, in the cities when you make decisions. For example, we had this in, in the Netherlands, in Amsterdam, that they the city wants to make a decision about energy and about how to make, you know, make sustainable energy for everybody. And then they had the citizen summits. Uh, many people were invited 
to, to share their thoughts about uh, the policies uh, uh, in relation to energy uh, sustainability. But what we um, actually see in that, in that participatory approach of governance is very much based on this deliberative democracy that actually the public space have to create space for voices of citizens to deliberate, to have conversations of dialogue with the people in position of power and decision making to make a change or to make it inclusive. What we see from our literature, that is important but not enough. Um, especially when we think about um, the work of Iris uh, Marion Young, uh, who has written about deep democracy. Uh, and deep democracy as a concept is actually about bringing deliberative democracy a step further. So deliberative democracy is a space where citizens can come and, and share their uh, concerns and their views. But what happens with the people who are not allowed in these spaces? Or people who are not used to take the space, uh, public space, to share their ideas? So what do you do with silenced voices or people marginalized voices? So deep democracy or deep democracy brings actually deliberative democracy one step further. How do we, with the question, how do we create space in democratic spaces or public spaces in the process of decision making for voices that are not used to be part of our conversation or they are often also marginalized or even silenced in those processes because we are, we want to have consensus and we don't want disruption in the processes very often. So even within the context of deliberative democracy, we want actually to have a kind of rationalized voices that are you know, acceptable for us to include, but not so much, for example, emotional voices or voices that are not very similar to us or disrupt us. And then, uh, deep democracy is exactly the question of how to include those voices. The, the voices that we most of the time prefer to in, ignore. And then, if you think about deep democracy, a deeper notion of deliberation, then the, the issue of power becomes very important. Most of the time, when we think about power, especially in the decision-making process, we think about power of position, people who are in position of power. So that actually is more kind of visible form of power. So you can pinpoint it, you can see, okay, who are the people who can make decisions? But more and more in, in the studies um, about governance and about social science, in social sciences, if we read more about other kind of power, the normalized, what we call normalized form of power, power which is invisible, power which is, if we think about Michel Foucault's concept discourse, discursive power. And what is discursive power? Discursive power is a network of words and images that are around us, influence us without us realizing it. So we have certain kind of ideas, which is very contextual, very historically shaped, about ourselves and about groups that we do yeah, uh, work with or make policy about. And these images and words are networks around us. And there is the power because they influence our thinking our policies, our decision making, without us realizing that it is working. So it, the power is in normalizing our thoughts and our actions without realizing. If you think about this, the power, normalizing power, discursive power, as power which is not visible, we cannot pinpoint, we cannot say, this person has that power. No, it is in the a network. So it is very difficult to detect, very less tangible than the position of power, which is very much localized, connected to people. What is happening also recently is that this kind of power becomes even more strengthened, the power of images, through digitalization. So we see the 
you know, the idea of algorithms, algorithms in the digi digital world makes us smarter. We are, when we talk about smart cities and smart organization, when you have digital, digitalization in order, but algorithms also homogenizes our thinking. So because they, algorithms actually shape our, in a way, feed us with certain kind of things that we like. So when you have a preference on the social media, you get all the, all the images coming in that kind of direction. So in a way, smart makes us also poor in imagination because it, it feeds us with the same kind of things. It homogenizes our images and our thoughts. So in that sense, the normalizations, normalization process of power becomes even more normalized through digitalization. So we become smarter, but not per se wiser. And I will talk about that. Wise, in this case, means to be able to connect to people who are different than us, to create connectedness in the world, to be more, to, to, to broaden our horizon and not be very much confined in, uh, in, in the bubbles, I would say bubbles in terms of thinking or in terms of social interaction. Another point, which is also strengthening this normalizing power is time. Uh, Thomas Highland uh, Erickson, a uh, Norwegian anthropologist, has written this, this essay about tyranny of time. He says we don't have dictators in most of the, the, the countries we think about, but yeah, we have dictators, unfortunately, uh, still. But the dictator is time because it dictates our actions. We are, we are doing everything faster and faster and faster. We want to be more efficient and our digitalization is the idea makes us more efficient. So in that going fast, we also forget a lot. And one of the things we forget is multiplicity around us. I always, you know, my, my context is the Netherlands, so I always use the, the biking. It's not, I see bikes here, but not as much as in the Netherlands. Uh, in Amsterdam, for example, I always say, people bike like crazy. So the most dangerous uh, transporters in the Netherlands or in Amsterdam are the bikers, not the cars. So they go very fast, and the idea is to go from A to B as, as fast as possible. And then you go that you go a, a, a path, you go that day in day out, fast, 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 and then once you get the flat tire, so you say, oh no, I have to. What should I do now? So you have to do sometimes the same path. You have to walk. And what happens in slowing down is that you see much more around you. So all the buildings you forgot when you were going fast. You see it. All the noises that you ignore because you were not paying attention, you hear it. All the smells even. So what happens is that when you slow down, you see more. So you see multiplicity around you that you have ignored while going fast. And that is also the power of normalization. We go fast because we, are, we want to get somewhere, but we forget about the process and what is needed to take care of in that process. So wisdom is also about seeing more of the multiplicity around us and not go too fast to forget it. So if you think about resisting power or resisting this kind of homogenization of thoughts and thinking, when you think about power opposition when we have for example suppressive power is top down or when people exclude you you see them you know where it is located so most of the time you go against it and to go against power is more about demonstrating going to the streets or strike so you know how to go against it but then the power is normalized it's discursive it's everywhere and over is not located in people, but it's located in a network which is not tangible. How do you go against it? What are the ways to disrupt that kind of normalizing power? 
how is it possible to resist it? And that is actually for us the, the, main, the main question. Because we know how to protest against the power when it's visible, but we don't know always, especially when you are in the decision-making process, how to go against the power which is less visible. So in, in my work and in our work, we are working with a different world. When we talk about visible power, the world is against. But when we talk about mobilizing power, the world is in between. So we have to create in between actions or situations to disrupt normalizing power. And then this becomes a bit uh, maybe um, Difficult to follow what is in between, but let me first, before going there, explain one example from my own experience. The impossibility going against normalizing power. I came, I have been born in Iran a long time ago, and I have been part of the Iranian revolution of 1979 as an activist. I was at that time a Marxist activist. Uh, as a young girl, very active in the revolution. My, my world changed when I became an activist uh, because I felt that I can change not only Iran, but also the world. But as you know, what happened in Iran after, probably you know, uh, after two years, uh, this we, we called spring of freedom changed into the new kind of dictatorship. And I had to leave the country. So I became an asylum seeker myself. I came end of 80s to the Netherlands. Um, and then what, what I faced was very interesting because I was, I come from a secular family. I was a Marxist activist. I was a human rights activist. I was a human rights activist at that time. And you enter a country, uh, a wealthy state like Netherlands, um, and I was puzzled because in Iran, I knew I was fighting against dictatorship. I was fighting against uh, for justice, for freedom. And so for me, it was very clear where the power was, who were the good guys, who were the bad guys. I knew I was on the, uh, I, I believe I was on the right side of history and the, the bad guys were on the wrong side of the history. That is the divisions of a May. I came to the Netherlands and I was, Facing these images, end of 80s, imagine 88, images of a refugee being helpless, uh, needs help, uh, uh, Iranian women coming from Islamic background, probably suppressed by other men in the family, so not very emancipated. So I was like, and then this kind of othering with a big O, I was facing it every day on the streets, in the interactions, even with uh, NGOs who were who were supposed to help me. I was thinking, what is this? Because that was a different kind of power, and I didn't know what to do with it. I didn't know how, how do you fight people who want to come, you know, have, who are in conversation with you, even have a very good intention to help you, but other put you in this box. That was the kind of power I was completely unaware of. You know, I didn't know how to do this. It was out of my any kind of, it took away my agency, my, my power to action towards it. So I was puzzled. That's why you can imagine that became uh, part of my study to understand how to deal with it. So if I think about in between, and that is what we, uh, in, in, in all the work we have been doing, try to understand how do you resist this kind of power, which is everywhere, which is even with good intentions, goes together with good intentions, but in a way, that good intentions are translated, others you, does not give space for your perspectives, for your talent, for your competence, uh, how to go about it. And again, I, we have three different action, points of action in between, we call it in between actions or in between situations. To start with is in between the lines. Often, especially in the, and that's, I'm, I'm curious about your context again, in the Netherlands, as an over-regulated society, rules are rules. So it would be very important to find spaces that are in between the lines. And then I, I work with this, um, with this um, 
quote of one of the ex-ministers of the Netherlands, uh, Hirsch Berlin says, in a space that we cannot capture in rules and regulations, something extra extraordinary happens, something meaningful, a moment of consideration for the specific aspect of someone's life situation, a moment of possible governmental and legal creativity. And I have again my example. When I came to Netherlands as an asylum seeker, I, as, as you can imagine, I had to wait for the status. I couldn't start immediately, legally, I couldn't start with the language and with study. I had to wait. But there was possibility from the, uh, at that time, universities, institutions, even governments, the city of Amsterdam helped me to to follow a Dutch language course. They helped me with it, although it was not legal, but they found a way in between the lines. University, Frank University was not allowed to accept me as a student, but still they did. I could start my study anthropology a year after I entered the country. And I was third year student anthropology when I got my status as an asylum seeker, as a refugee. So the fact that people were able to be creative enough not to go against the rules, but to find the ways in between the lines of regulations to give me space to start immediately has been essential, I always say, for me being successful and, and uh, become a professor is one thing in the Netherlands. You have five people with other ethnic backgrounds who are female and professor, full professor at the university, but in three years, um, the, the last three years, I have been also called one of the most influential Dutch people uh, in the Netherlands, 200 most influential. So you can become very successful in a context if you get the chance to start immediately as a refugee or asylum seeker. Why is that? Because we did a lot of studies showing that the waiting period, which is actually after asylum, for, for in the Netherlands, the Dutch context is for years, for three, four years, can be really disastrous for asylum seekers because they enter the country with a lot of baggage that is negative, you know, memories uh, of suppression for most of them. And then if you are put in a waiting period, in a waiting room actually, without having the possibility to invest and develop yourself and be focused on the on the on the present and future. What happens is that you are you become prisoner of your memories, past memories, and that can lead to depression, to do you lose your motivation, and after three four years when you have your permit, you have to start immediately without any motivation or even energy or even the the mindfulness. To, to build a new life. Mm -hmm. So what we do is that we, we lose a lot as a society when we are not able to build on the motivation and energy of the first years for refugees and asylum seekers to build new lives. And then and in reading in between lines and being able to be to create to create creativity in the in the governmental processes and in the policy making would be very important for that to keep the energy and the positive energy which is in the, in the first years, necessary to really build a new life, learn a new language, you need everything, you know, you learn a new language, study, and learn a new society. The second, uh, the second action would be in between individuals. And what, the, what do we mean in between individuals? Um, when, I, when I was studying uh, anthropology and later, Philosophy, I came, I, I came to this you know, essay by Edward Said, uh, intellect, uh, Intellectual as Exile, or Intellectual Exile. It's an essay which is, um, for, for me, it was very refreshing because, as you mentioned, I was considered all the time as a problem category, not only by policymakers, but also by academics, because refugees, exiles, or migrants are often considered to be in between spaces. And often, often 
with this duality as a friend. So you are either or, you are neither nor, you are, uh, you're, 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 we don't know what is your loyalty, uh, what is, actually what, what is the source of belonging, you are lost in between the context. So the, the problem category is always defining in between us as a problem, as something which is actually abnormal. And that is, because of that, is problematic. What Edward Said in the essay does, which is very, was refreshing for me, and also very empowering at the time, was to turn, turn it around, say, okay, if you think about in between us as a source of, yeah, uh, of course, falling in between lines, falling, lost, get lost sometimes in the, in the near north, but it can also be a source of originality, a potential for originality and creativity, because you cannot be normalized by one context. You have to always put different contexts uh, as mirroring. You have to always, everything that happens in a new context, you cannot take it for granted because you have a different context to compare it with. So in between us can be a source of the potential, actually, for originality, to question things that others take for granted. So the fact that you are constantly mirroring contexts or points of reference or reference frames in terms of culture, in terms of context, in terms of structures, can be actually a potential for reflexivity, a potential to question normalizing power. And it is a potential, it doesn't mean that it's actualized all the time. So it is potential that has to be worked on. It has to, in terms of capacity building, it has, you have to really make it, embrace it as a source of creativity and originality. Otherwise, you just lose it. You, can, you don't see it even, because you are always a program category. You don't see the other side. You have to really act, you know, act on it and be more aware of it. And then he uses, Edward say this condition of exile as something that intellectuals or public intellectuals or people who want to, to make a difference, because intellectuals is not always a term we use these days, but people who want to make a difference in the world, in their societies, uh, they can embrace that, that condition of in-betweenness and create it for themselves. So to create this element of mirroring context by including more diversity in their organizations or really inviting people from different perspectives to their uh, to their fora to, to discuss with them so to bring in this contextual challenge or contextual unsettling to also challenge this normalizing power so what what the condition of exile is is something that he would say intellectual have, have to embrace to be able to also question status quo, to question the normalizing power. So to bring in creativity, uh, we have to become in, in between individuals, all of us. But in this case, we have written a report in Dutch, um, which we, we maybe, if you just translate the summaries, summary of it in English, uh, in which we have actually identified when we talk about refugee advocates, and they identify different groups in that. And one of the groups we talk about, uh, which is very central to our um, report, is actually the, the advocates uh, who have embedded stories. Uh, embedded stories is that when you are part of decision-making process, sometimes, sometimes you, you have in these advisory roles, you, you search for representatives of the group. It was the old version. Now we have individuals to come and tell their individual stories. And then it can also be ignored by policy making. We have seen the Netherlands happening. So, okay, it is one individual story like all others. So, how, what can, how can we make policy for one individual story? So, it is important to unsettle some of the thinking, but it is not enough to really make the, 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 the policy making put a focal. But we talk about uh, embedded stories, are the stories that are less than representative or more than individual, somewhere in between. And what are these stories? These are the stories of uh, advocates who have 
we make three different kinds of consciousness as a kind of important element of that embedded narratives. They have practical consciousness. It means that they are living in a new context long enough to know how the things work, to be familiar with the structures. So practical consciousness means you know how to navigate the structure a bit. So you are familiar with the current structure, current society you're part of. You have also reflective consciousness. So you have not left your country too long ago, which is too far away. So you are not completely assimilated in the new context, but you still have past and present in a kind of simultaneously present in your consciousness. So you are able to use the past and present as mirrors uh, so that you can actually be reflective about uh, the structures you are part of, both structures, past and present, or more structures. So you question the, the structures because of this mirroring impact of the past and present. And the third element is relational consciousness, which is about advocates who have networks with other, uh, with their soulmates, in this case refugees who have the large network with other refugees and their stories, what they tell to the policymakers, is quite embedded in that, uh, in that network. So they, they not only tell their own story, but they, they share the patterns comes from those networks, the patterns of stories mm -hmm. that comes from refugee experience. So in that sense, their, their stories are relational, uh, based on relational consciousness. And these three elements are important to think about, about the, the in-between individuals that are from the refugee background and they have not only embedded but also embodied experience of being a refugee in, in the policy making process, which yeah, actually asks for different kind of receptiveness to our, to our if they have to If they have and bring this knowledge which is not individual and not representative. Representative is impossible, actually, if you pick it up. But this is actually as close as you can get to the life world of refugees. And when you include that, it means that they have to have quite equal position in the um, reception of their ideas in the decision-making process. And the third aspect that I want to add is in between, third form of in-betweenness in terms of actions is in between spaces. In between spaces and also in our literature we refer to uh, as interspaces. These are spaces, imagine, that are different than, than the discursive spaces. As I mentioned, normalized power work through discourses and discourses, discursive spaces we are positioned in. It works, you know, when we are in conversation these discourses are all over the place. And it, if we you know, bring our ideas to the table, it's very much influenced by those discursive networks around us. In between spaces are about spaces that you make space within the space. So within a discursive space, you make a choice to make a space which is empty of judgment. And one of the concepts we use from Theodor Bru, who is a Dutch philosopher, is epoche, um, which is a familiar concept actually in philosophy, uh, in phenomenology, uh, in general approach of, uh, of uh, yeah, in philosophy. Uh, epoche is about temporarily suspending your own judgment, or what you call it, you know, to step, to step aside, to, to, to visualize it when you make a space, Instead of coming into the space with your ideas and your thoughts and your opinions, you take a step aside to make the space free of judgment and free of all these subjective ideas that come to the space. When you do that, it makes it possible to listen to the story of other uh, uh, from the position of other. So you, you create the possibility for deep listening Instead of bringing the ideas in, you create a space for listening and different form of connection to diversity. Uh, when you listen, when somebody presents a story, 
in a in a space, in the interspace or in between space, which is empty of judgment, you hear the story of a person and not the other with a capital O. You see a story of somebody with struggles, with concerns, with problems. But then the problems are not problem categories you have in your mind, but problems are really connected to the life world of people that you are talking with. And when that happens, when the stories come, and when you are able to, to listen to them uh, in a deeper sense and depart from their position, authority is a term, approach them from their position, you see completely different. You, you can replace and, and change your position temporarily to see different things, to broaden your horizon, to see more of the worlds we are part of. And alternative is a term comes from Jewish philosopher uh, Emmanuel Levinas, who has been also very uh, inspiring for us, both of us, when, because Elena has also a philosophical background, when we do philosophy. And in that, you know that Western philosophy uh, has very much the subject, the individual, as a point of departure. And uh, Levinas have criticized that after uh, you know, the violence of Second World War uh, against uh, Jewish population, he said, you know, the, one of the problems maybe has been that we depart always from the self. But we need to depart from the other. And then the other does actually ask for our responsibility, you know, in, in a way that we, we create a shared responsibility for the world when we approach from the other instead of from ourselves. And that was that why the concept of authority has been so appealing to me to consider it in, in if you really want to, especially when make connections or having this relational capacity develop it, um, especially when the other is so with a big O, is the capital O is so different from us and so distant from us. We need to have methodologies or spaces that makes it possible to come closer, to bring our world closer, our life world closer to the life world of the other, but also our sustained world, in a way we are positioned within the structures and systems and governments, closer to the life world of the people whom we make policy about. So I think it's almost time to, to come to the conclusion. I have been talking a lot. Uh, it's OK. You are still with me. Uh, we have a lot of, I, I really would love to have your feedback and, and, and conversations and your positioning in the story. Um, but to conclude, actually, to give the potential of this, uh, what I call, in between actions against this normalizing power, we need to really work on the competences of all actors involved in the process of decision making. And all the actors involved, most of the time when we talk about capacity building, we talk about capacity building of the people with problem. We want to empower them. But capacity building in our case is about everybody. So uh, for policymakers, it's important to have the capacity building to see more, to listen better, and to also be receptive uh, to the moments when the perspective of the other becomes disruptive. As I mentioned, in participatory spaces, or participatory governance, we, we tend to actually exclude disruptions. But as I mentioned earlier, for normalizing power, disruption is essential to see differently and to broaden our horizon. Uh, so we have to have the capacity, and that is very important, to develop the competence. It's very difficult because we are very much, we want to be concerned, we, have to, we want to have consensus, but we have, well, how we do, go about these options, how we, what is the competence to have, for example, in, in, in between spaces, to accept disruption, but be also careful that it doesn't become a kind of panic zone, that people uh, create more distance. So to, to find a balance between, the two, to actually to come from disruption to connection, or to broadening the horizon. That is the comp competence which is very necessary for policymakers or NGOs who are working with refugees to develop that, to bring in different ideas and views, perspectives, to disrupt their own normalizing power and to make 
better connections, uh, a deeper listening. But also for the refugees, it's very refugee advocates, it's very important to build the competence so that they can actualize their potential, as I mentioned, the potential uh, competence or being a creative because of all these elements of consciousness I men mentioned. Potentially, there, but you have to make it actual. You have to make that transformative. How do you do that? How do you embrace all these elements of possibility of reflectiveness uh, in, and, and also creating a relational consciousness? How do you translate it into really com have conversation with policymakers, uh, people in position of power, so that they listen to you and then you can really uh, cooperate and, uh, and, and co-create difference. Uh, and then from these capacity buildings, from all the actors, we come to capacity sharing. Uh, and, and then it is important to bring all these perspectives together and create a connectedness that we can influence and enrich each other in that process. And for that, we need, we work with spaces. Gaventa uh, has talked about different spaces in which policymakers most of the time engage with, uh, with refugees and one of the one of the spaces is uh, most of the time the closed spaces they, they are not spaces in which uh, the minorities in this case refugees are included but we have um, invite very often invited spaces that is actually the, the most dominant way of including refugee voice and, and you mentioned, mentioned the the e the digital possibility platform or uh, we have advisory possibilities that you invite people into the space, but what's happening in most of these spaces, as I mentioned, either uh, the refugees come in and they don't feel really heard because the, the frame is very much set and they are invited to say something, but it is not really a deep invitation. It's actually kind of maybe framing more than, than really deep engagement with the perspectives that they bring. Or the refugees that come in, they have individual story, but that individual story is interesting for the moment, but it, what is, it's not really taken into consideration for uh, considering or reconsidering the policy. So that is very important that inviting space as we, we shape it is not really based on in between. Is the condition of in betweenness, um, and then we have created spaces that often the refugee advocates themselves create spaces and invite policymakers to come in, and then they are invited in their space. In that sense, there is connection, but that can, that can have also some limitations because it can be very inspiring, but if it is not a space that that policymakers themselves own as their own space then it can also be forgotten. It can be a kind of inspiration, but forgotten. So we talk, in our work, we talk about co-created spaces, that are spaces that actually policymakers, uh, but also NGOs, or all the people who have the, you know, in, in a way, in a position of influencing the refugee inclusion and integration, and refugee advocates, they co-create this space together so that also they co-own the space. So they are, when you are co-owner of the space, then you can also see the value of this connectedness to bring in different perspectives. And for co-creative spaces to really be transformative, you, re you have to create this space for polyfocality, for polyfocality of perspectives. So, and value them equally. So think about, you know, these perspectives are important mm -hmm. and valuable to think about it and bring it together. And from that co-creation, think about transformative policy making that are really impactful for the lives of people we're talking about. Because all the efforts and all the intentions of policy making is to make a difference. And then we can make a difference, then we have these co-creative spaces, but for that to work, we need to first invest in capacity building of all the actors and then bring in capacity sharing. I think that would be my, my talk for now. Thank you so much for your attention. Thank you.